Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. The game of life is a lot more, though, than all of these critters you can make that do things and this, this construction and all that. From a hacker's perspective, it's also the genesis of one of the most amazing and elegant algorithms, computer algorithms ever invented, and that's Bill Gosper's hash life. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Let's see. So the simple schoolboy life algorithm simply iterates over a grid going to every single cell, calculating the next transition for that cell. So if I've got a 1,000 by 1,000 universe and I advance it 1,000 generations in time, it's going to cost me more than a billion operations. That's slow and painful. Multiplication is like that. There's a lot of tricks we can use to speed things up, bit tricks, skipping empty space, looking for oscillators, recognizing gliders, you know, all this hack com adds complexity to the code. Eventually, we actually end up with diminishing returns where this complexity slows us down. About the 80s, which was a good 14 years after life was invented, um, rumors started circulating about this unbelievable algorithm that could calculate life patterns billions of time units into the future. And it could manage life patterns with billions of cells. To give context, at this time, we were typically doing 20 generations a second or something like that. So this was completely unheard of. So um, Rudy Rucker visited Bill Gosper about 1987. And he said, Gosper showed me some amazing game of life simulations that were based on a weird speed up algorithm of his called hash life. I remember sharing the source code for the trick. But for me, this was strictly a case of the mathematician godfather. He makes you an offer you can't understand. <laughs> now, Gosper's hash life is fantastic. It's a very simple algorithm that generalizes the type of optimizations we normally perform when trying to make a life algorithm fast. And I'm going to cover the three main things it does. It compresses space using canonicalized quad trees. It caches the results. And finally, their super speed. And that's the punchline for this talk. I hope I get it in under six minutes. The key here, though, is direct computation on a compressed representation. So that's the one thing you want to take away from this talk. OK, what's a quad tree? Well, if I've got a bitmap and it's a power of two on a side, I can represent this bitmap simply by splitting it up into four quadrants and then represent each one of those recursively in the same manner until I'm all the way down to the leaves where there's only a one pixel. So this is a very simple representation of a bitmap. In order to get compression out of it, what I can do is I can identify identical subnodes. So in this particular 4x4 pattern, we have the northwest corner and the southeast corner are identical. So we use one copy of that subtree in memory. And as you can see, in this case, we've gone from a 21-node quad tree down to a, what is that, 6-node six, six quad tree. So that's pretty good. Um, so that's, that's quad trees. The next thing we want to do is add life into the mix. So we calculate the next generation for a particular subnode, and we remember it for that node. Unfortunately, when we're calculating the next generation for this 8 by 8 square, we can't be certain what the neighbors are because we're only focused on this node. So we have to throw away the border, which leaves us with 6 by 6. But 6 by 6 we can't represent because our quad trees only handle powers of 2. So we throw away more, and we end up with a 4 by 4 result for this 8 by 8 subnode. Uh, there's a recursive subroutine that actually does the work here. We ask the subnodes for their results and collect them together. It's a little more complicated than I want to get into, but it's something that you can figure out as an exercise for the reader, say. It's straightforward. So after we have the result, we can actually attach that result to the quad tree node. So we cache it. So we don't have to repeat this calculation. OK, so we're caching it. So. Next thing we want to do is we want to save this information across time. And the way we do that is instead of having one hash table for canonicalization of one quad tree and another one for the next generation, we share the same hash node for all the generations. And that way, we can preserve and use these cast results across time. So what we have is a great algorithm. It's really fast. It's almost hash life, OK? It's faster than almost all algorithms out there. Um, 
So it, it optimizes oscillators and gliders and spaceships and all that stuff. So for example, the conventional fast quick life in Gali will do about 6,000, is that 6,000? 6, 6,000 generations in a second for a pattern called breeder, which is this pattern. Um, it will do about 48,000 generations in one second if we use what we've described so far, okay, which is not quite Hashley. And the pattern gets quite big with millions of cells. So obviously we're handling a little bit more. One little change turns this into hash life. Okay, all we need to do is use super speed. So this time, the higher nodes actually calculate further ahead in time. So we, we had that eight by eight node and we showed how it calculated one generation forward. Instead of calculating one generation forward, we make that eight by eight node generate two generations forward by recursively calling its children multiple times, okay? And the 256 by 256 node advances one quarter of that, 64 generations in time. And this continues on up the tree. So a 32K by 32K node actually jumps 8K generations ahead at a time. What does this do for us? Well, it actually means that instead of going from 6,000 to 48,000 generations in a second, all of a sudden we're able to calculate some huge number with 768 digits, number of generations in that one second. And that is hash life. That is magic. <laughs> and that's my talk. <laughs>